hear us on the radio. It's pretty cool. So you can't, you can't get away from us. We're everywhere. Uh, Sam Autry is going to, as we stand, going to lead us in our call to worship today in the liturgical church. It is Pentecost Sunday, and we are uh, celebrating in that uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birthday of the church. We have a verse that relates that, so if you'd all stand. Stand with us today. Our call to worship is John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit whom those who believe in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we cannot live this life without your Spirit. So Lord, we thank you so much for the presence of your Spirit in our lives. Help us to recognize your Spirit. Help us to obey and walk in the Spirit, Lord, so we'll not fulfill the desires of our flesh. Today, Lord, we celebrate you, uh, your spirit that comes. But Lord, I pray that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Father. Receive our worship today, Lord, and as we, as we receive your word in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. You may be seated. As you're being seated today, it's our hope, it's our goal that everyone get their very own Calvary Chapel bulletin. Uh, same bulletin we had in the first service. If you didn't get a bulletin, if you slip up your hand, one will be provided for you momentarily. We're grateful for uh, the opportunity to uh, provide for you all kinds of great information. Once you get a bulletin or have a bulletin, if you'd pull off this little side piece, kind of shake it. If you're a guest today, this is your first time, first time in a long time, there's a spot there uh, to put uh, your, your, your name and any information you feel comfortable giving us. On the back for all of us is an opportunity for a name and any commitment or decision or anything going on in your life you want us to know. Hey, if you're graduating from, someone told you, maybe mistakenly, that you're graduating from high school or college, like John Bonneman, Dr. John Bonneman, as of this weekend. They weren't messing with you. You actually graduated, John. Wow. Wow. I think that deserves a big round of applause. We're all very, very proud of you, John. Amazing. Amazing. Look at that. So, but... Uh, if, 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 if something like that's going on in your life, let us know. Graduation Sunday is June 25th. We want to honor you with something very, very special. What do you give a doctor? John, what do they give a doctor? What do you, what, what's, what's, what's like a gift you give them? A stethoscope? You need, that's kind of cheap, though, isn't it? Do, do, do we need to give you like... Uh, uh, a, a corpse to work with for the rest of your life? Yeah. Something like that? I don't know. We'll, we'll figure all, all of that out. Uh, but if you'd be so kind to do that. Uh, we're going to sing our welcome song now. Jay, what's today's welcome song? I want to know you more, Pastor. Well, Jay, we can try and get together, maybe do some lunch or something like that. But that's about all I can do. We'll stand and sing. Tell somebody you want to get to know Jesus more as the team plays. Uh, and, uh, you know, welcome everybody to church today. Take it away, Jay.
Amen. You may be seated. Just a couple things I want to draw your attention to. If you do have the bulletin, you'll note in there there's a registration form for the summer classes for the New York Institute for Biblical Studies. We have only one class, Angels in the End of the Age, and it's online. If you want to sign up for that, please do so. NYIBS.net, NYIBS.net, if you want to sign up that way uh, for our listening audience. I do want to welcome our radio audience. Thank you for joining us today. Maybe you're out suffering for the Lord on the beach in Ocean Grove. We feel so bad for you. I'm glad that we could be here for you. Uh, maybe that's where you are. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, you're just homebound today. You weren't feeling well. Thank you for joining us. I thank uh, Juan and Christian. They're up there in the booth making it possible for everybody to hear us and to see us. And uh, let's give them a big, big thank you. Thank you, God, for coming in on Memorial Day weekend, making that all happen. We're grateful for that. At this time in our service, we take a moment to give back to the Lord. Uh, we give our offering to Him. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and to receive that offering. I'm going to ask Raul to grab the mic and to pray for us. Um, thank God for the offering as well as everybody who's here today. So, Raul, it is all yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, oh God, for this service, this worship belongs to you, Father. Bless the giver, Lord, to expand, Lord, and extend your ministry, Father. Lord, thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your kindness, and for your love for us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me. Yeah. 
God of Jacob.
Can you remain standing as we read the scriptures together from Genesis 35, verses 1 through 4, about our God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's read it together. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar. To the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word and the power that is in it. Thank you, Lord, that it changes our life. Thank you that we can come to you together today in prayer and bring our requests to you knowing that you are a God who answers and meets our deepest needs. Thank you, Lord, as we prayed this week for Paul Matthew and Alice Bingham, that, Lord, you raised them up, and they were both with us today in your house. Alice doing her greeter ministry. Thank you, Lord, for your help. Please continue to help Mickey Vasquez and... Richie Wells to heal from their heart surgery, and Alex Rodriguez as he recovers from his surgery. We bring before you, Lord, right now, the Romano family. As Mike, mom, went home to be with you last night, we pray that you will give them peace and strength and comfort. We pray, Lord, for the Damari Harrell family, the young 13-year-old boy from Stapleton, shot in the head a week ago Friday, passed away this past week. We pray for him, Lord. Not him, but his family, God. Help them and comfort them in this unimaginable time. Lord, we have such violence in our city. And Lord, we fear if they took all the guns away, we would use knives. We fear if we took all the knives away, we'd use bats. Lord, there's something wrong with our hearts. We need Jesus. May, Lord, our authorities, our leaders, say the politically incorrect thing. Help me, God. Help me, Jesus. Lord, thank you that you are the God of grace. And where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Help us, Lord, to cling to that promise. And, Lord, on this Memorial Day weekend, we remember those who gave the ultimate price paid the ultimate price for our freedoms. We think of their families. We pray for, Lord, your peace and comfort for them. And Lord, in our time together now, we pray for you to touch each of us as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We continue our series today. We have just a few weeks left, really only five weeks after, uh, actually only four weeks after today. East of Eden. And the title of this section, at least I've entitled this section, Jacob Reunited and It Feels So Good. And so this is clear in your head, that's sarcasm. Because when Jacob and his family get back together, it's not so great. It has its bumps, its major bumps. The truth is, we as people, we as followers of the one true God, we are always struggling with who we are. We are always struggling with who we want to be. We have a way of self-destructing, of taking the blessings of God and flipping them on, on ourselves. We can take, <laughs> we can take victory and turn it into defeat that quickly. Sometimes we're like the Boston Celtics. 
I am obviously a Boston Celtics fan. And last night, they had the game with the Miami Heat won. It was over. Now, if the Celtics lose a game, they're out of the playoffs. And they're trying to do what no one else has ever accomplished. They have a much better team than Miami, but they got themselves down three games to none. And they had won two games, and last night, it looks like they were on a perfect winning track. But there's something about this Celtic team. It finds a way. It finds a way to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. And they were up by a bunch of points, 10 points with a few minutes to play, and they decided that they would take a hiatus. And then their best player, Al Horford, decides when Jimmy Butler is to take a crazy shot and the Celtics are up by two to foul Butler in three-point range, meaning that Butler will get three free throws, three free throws, and put Miami ahead. So Halford, who is their best player, fouls Butler. And Butler doesn't make one free throw. He doesn't make two free throws. He makes three free throws. They are up on the Celtics by one point with three seconds to play. Now, the reason the Celtics that were playing or having such difficulty, in my opinion, was Marcus Smart, who decided that down the stretch, he would miss free throws. So they throw the ball in for the last shot to guess who? Marcus Smart! And as much as I could scream with three seconds left, I was screaming, not smart! Not smart! Oh, no! Anyone but smart! Jason Tatum, Tatum, Jalen Brown, anybody! But they gave it to Smart, and he shot, and the ball went in, and it rimmed, and it came out. And the game was over, but Derek White came out of nowhere and with 0.1 seconds left, tapped the ball in. And in disbelief, anyone who was a Celtic fan just sat and said, I can't believe this. The Celtics won. Turn this up, if you will. It's off the smart for the seventh game. Now, the Melbourne tipped in, but the buzzer sounded. The light was on. It'll be reviewed. I don't think he got that in in time. Great effort by Derek White. And didn't I say you have... Oh, they're saying on the floor, they're counting it. You have to protect the offensive rebounding. Oh, he got Long rid of it. Time. He That's sure a did. Celtic and, win, and, and we're going and Celtics, to Game 7. The Celtics are going to win. There's a Game 7 back in Boston. Ruling on the floor is good basket. The play's under review. The Celtics won. I was shocked. Where sin abounded, when the Celtics' tendency to self-destruct abounded, grace super abounded. Jacob and his family are in the promised land. They're ahead. They're winning big time. They're blessed, and they do everything they can to lose. They self-destruct before our eyes in the passages we will look at today. When sin abounded, grace superabounded. We as followers of Jesus Christ could not be more blessed spiritually and many times physically speaking. Yet, we have an uncanny way of self-destructing. We have an uncanny way of taking victory and making it defeat. It seems to be in our DNA, because it is. But where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. In Genesis chapter 
34, if you're following along in the scriptures or in the study guide, we see the struggles of Jacob and his family, the incredibly sad story of the rape of Jacob's daughter. Now, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, remember Jacob had had four different wives and four different relationships with women and, and thus four different people he had kids by. Now, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, this is her only daughter, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. Tough stuff. Jacob and Leah's only daughter, she went out to see the women of the land. There's nothing nefarious, nefarious about this. They were newly transplanted, transplanted, transplanted from, you know, Haran. She just wants to meet some people. She wants to meet, have new friends. Where do you go to do that? Well, you probably went to the well. So she goes to the local well, maybe. We can go to a cafe. And Shechem is a prince of the land. His father's king, so he's going to inherit everything. He saw her. The, the strength of this word is he may have spied her out. He may have been, you know, hmm, she's a fine woman. And then he seized her. He brought her into his possession. And then he sexually assaulted her. He laid with her and he humiliated her. But the weird thing happened. This weird thing. His soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. Hey, uh, it's a little late for that. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamar, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. This girl I have sexually assaulted. Just by way of understanding, Shechem, which is really named for the sun, is in this part of Israel. Jerusalem is way down yonder. Uh, Shechem is, is kind of middle Israel. And now watch the response of Jacob's family because it's, it's very telling. There is passivity on Jacob's part. I, I, I can't speak for others, but if someone had done any of my children wrong, I would have flipped out. But what does it say Jacob did? Now, Jacob heard that he, Shechem, had defiled his daughter, Dinah. But his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamar, father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. I, I, I think you can make a strong argument that Jacob is a wuss. Not a brave man. He wants the boys to come home before he does anything. And he speaks to Hamar. So Jacob heard. He held his shalom. He held his peace. And he had Hamar in his presence to discuss the matter. What's there to discuss? But watch the pain of Jacob's sons. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard it. And the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. Note the, the pain and, and what goes on in these brothers' lives. They're grieved or vexed. And it says they're very angry. The, the Hebrew text says they're greatly hot. They are hot and mad, and ready to do something. What had been done was outrageous in defiance of moral and social standards, and such a thing must not be done. This can't stand, period. So they have a plan. Another word for it would be a scheme. Where would they have learned how to scheme? Jacob. They got it honestly. Sadly, our behavior as parents, even when we don't want it to be, is passed to our kids. There's a desperate plea here from Hamar. Hamar, Hamar spoke with them, saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us 
Give us your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to us, to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. We can take this horrible thing and we can make it all better. He begs them to give in marriage Dinah to Shechem. And then, you know, not only that, intermarry with us. Get our property, buy, trade, sell. It'll be awesome. And then Shechem also said to her father, to Jacob, and to her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes. Whatever you say to me, I'll give. Ask for me for a great bride price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me, only give me the young woman to be my wife. Let me say it in another way. What's the hush money we need for this? Hush money isn't new. We'll just sign a non-disclosure act. We can can sweep this all under the rug. Just tell me how much I need to pay. Wow. What is he asking of Jacob and the brothers? He's asking them to pimp out the girl. Please see now the deceitful plot. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamar what? Deceitfully. Because he had defiled their sister. Treacherously. Yes, they learned how to deceive from Jacob. They said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. And all the men said, ouch. It's a half-truth. The reason they shouldn't intermingle with them is because they were pagans, and no amount of circumcision was going to change that. These guys have issues. This is a pagan culture. But listen, how depraved is it for the sons of Jacob to use the sign of the covenant, circumcision, as a scheme to get revenge? Not to mention that this was hitting below the belt, way below the belt. Their words please Hamar and Hamar's son Shechem. I don't understand why they would agree to this, but they're the bosses. So, All who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamar and his son Shechem. And every male, how many males? Every male was circumcised. All who went out of the gate of his city. All of them. Now watch the revenge of Jacob's family. The slaughter of the men. On the third day when they were sore. Do I need to explain that to you in depth? You probably, you you got it, right? You understand it? Two of the sons of Jacob, how many did it take? Two. Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. It was easy. You know, you you know how men are when they have a sore back. You know how men are when they have bad knees. Oh, oh. imagine then now. They killed Hamar. And his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. They slaughtered all the men and took Dinah home. And then they spoiled the city. Genesis 34, 28 and 29. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. Wow. They took everything Hamar and Shechem had promised them by force. You want us to marry and intermarry with you? You want us to do trade? You want us? Sure, no problem. After we kill you, we'll do all of that. Now, the repercussions were clear to Jacob, and he is afraid. Now, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I will be destroyed, both I and my household. 
But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Now, I do not think that the action of Shechem could stand. But I don't think that what Jacob's sons did was acceptable. It was horrible. And Jacob knows that there's a possibility of difficulty. You brought trouble on me. I stink before the inhabitants who are here. And th the problem is they outnumber us. And if they got together in a coalition, they would wipe the ground with us. It's true here, though. Jacob valued peace more than he did honor. He should have stood for the honor of his daughter. Please see the depravity here. The depravity is found in Shechem's behavior, and the depravity is found in the sons of Jacob's behavior. It is gross. It is horrible. Where is the grace? The Lord protected the nation of Israel, that few people from the other nations. Where sin abounded, what happened? Grace superabounded. But wait, there's more. In Genesis 35, the next chapter, there is this incredible experience of getting right with God. The text tells us there's a call to Bethel. Now, you've heard Bethel before. You know that Bethel is where Jacob began his journey with God. It's where he, 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 he had this vision of Jacob's ladder, right? That place was called Bethel. Well, God calls him back there. God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Go back to that, that starting point. And sometimes it's just wise for us to go back to the starting point, to the El Bethel, the house of God. Sometimes you just need to take the whole family to church. That's what needed to happen. They needed to take the whole family to church. It's amazing when we're afraid how quick we are to get to church. After 9-11, some 20 years ago, everybody was in church. Why? Because we were afraid. It was time to take everybody to church. When we have a crisis in our lives. Oftentimes, we, we run to the house of God. And in this case, they were running to the house of God. He's commanded to arise and go dwell in Bethel, house of God. And this is the same place Jacob had begun his faith journey when fleeing Esau. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first, but because it was where he met God, he called it the house of God. And it's just down. It's not that far from Shechem. But he said, get everybody together, and you're going to the house of God. Why? Because, man, you guys need to get right with me. You need to get right with me. But there's a cleansing before they go to Bethel. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. Isn't that amazing the way he says that? Whenever I was distressed, what did I say? Help! And God helped me. Wherever I have gone, from, Haran, from, from, from the promised land to Haran and back, God has been with me. But he wants them to do something. He's speaking to the whole household. They are all together on this. And he says, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Remove them and go in a different direction. Now, so that we understand, they had what we call household gods. They had little tiny gods made of rock, made of stone, some made of wood. They were worthless, but they held on to them. They held on to them because they thought that those 
household gods had special power. And that in trouble, those household gods would have their back. But in reality, they were simply stones that could not answer. But the problem is when we are coming to God out of a pagan world, we may leave the pagan world, but the pagan world doesn't leave us. You can't You can take people out of a pagan world, but now you must get the pagan world out of the people. We have so many habits from our lost state that we bring in to the faith with us. The weird thing about this particular text is Jacob takes these pagan gods and he breaks them all in pieces, right? No. He puts them under the Terberith tree. He buries them. Now, I don't know why he says that. Maybe so archaeologists can do the rest of their lives, go and dig under Tabarath trees in Israel and look for the the, the gods. But he kind of tells you where to find them if you're looking for them. And he says, purify yourself. Cleanse yourself both physically and spiritually and dress up, would you? Put on different clothes. Maybe put on your best clothes, guys. We're going to be in the presence of God. We're going to be in the presence of God. There's something to be said for continually recognizing that we are in the presence of Almighty God when we are in His house. We have a casual world. I understand that. But we have a God who is still the Almighty God of the universe and should be retreated with respect. Let us go to Bethlehem, build an altar to the God who answers me in my distress, who's been with me wherever I've gone. And then there's this beautiful consecration at Bethlehem. As they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. What did Jacob think was going to happen? Jacob thought that all those, all those little cities were going to get together and destroy him because of what his sons had done. But what happens in reality? They are afraid of them. Jacob worried the inhabitants of the land would come against him, but the opposite thing happened. And there he built an altar called the place El Bethel because God, there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. He goes back to kind of where he started. And then for some reason, they want us to know something sad happened here. And Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, did what? Nah. Rebecca, Jacob's mother's nurse, died. Which must have been devastating to Jacob. And she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So his name is called Alan Bakuth. God appears here to Jacob. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall you be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your body. Wow. Now you will remember, because you're a great Bible scholar, that just a couple chapters earlier, God had changed his name from Jacob, supplanter, to Israel. Why is God telling him it again? Because Jacob, like you and I, needs reassurance. He needs to be reminded over and over and over and over again. We are a forgetful people. There's a change of perspective about himself here. No longer are you Jacob, supplanter. Now you are Israel, prince with God. As a change of perspective on God, I am almighty God. Now Jacob had had that experience at Bethel before. But remember, his household is carrying around their little household idols. Got my little household idol here. What can it do? Nothing. Nothing. And now God wants him to know. He wants all of Jacob and his people to know, I am almighty God. I'm not like one of these worthless idols. I am almighty God. 
And there's this change of perspective on the future. Jacob, I know you're nervous. Jacob, I know you're afraid. But you, from you, will be nations and kings. And then Jacob worships God. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. A pillar is set up, and then a liquid offering is made, both water and oil. But please see the depravity. They were carrying their idols into the promised land. Probably some of the same household idols Rachel had stolen from Laban. Remember, in chapters just previous, that Laban was all upset that his household idols were missing. And Rachel had hidden them and been deceptive on keeping them. So he got these stupid household idols when the one true God is the one who has their back. Here's the grace. The Lord cleaned them up and renewed his covenant with Jacob. Where sin abounded, grace did what? Super abound. The next section is a section filled with sadness. There is a painful birth. A painful birth is not something that should surprise us. What, did it t- what was the promise to Eve in Genesis? That in, in, in bearing children, you're going to have pain. Well, the text is, is clear. It's, it's, it says, Then they journeyed from Bethel, where they were still, so, where they were still some distance from Epaphra. Rachel went into labor. She had hard labor. You say, Pastor Dave, is there any kind, other kind? She had hard labor, and they're, they're headed to Epaphra. Epaphra is Bethlehem. Sometimes when we read like Micah 5.2, when it says, O thou uh, Bethlehem Epaphra, we go like, what is Epaphra? Epaphra is just another name for Bethlehem. They're journeying to Bethlehem, and she is in hard labor. Hard labor, intense pain associated with childbirth. You you can't help as you read that to think about another woman on her way to Bethlehem who went into labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, do not fear for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name, what? Benanoi. But his father called his name, what? No pain blockers. She's going to have the baby, and it's going to hurt. But as she does, she bleeds to death. And she dies. The child's birth costs Rachel her life. And as she's giving birth, she calls his name Benoni, which means lamenting. Jacob will turn it around and say, this is Binyamin, the son of my right hand. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Epaphra. And this identifies Epaphra clearly as Bethlehem, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond, I just wanted you to see this next phrase, the what? Tower of Edar. Now, what I'm about to tell you is slightly speculative. So do not say that this is the absolute truth. Say this is Watsonian, okay? So if it's Watsonian, it could be wrong. It's not from heaven. But do you see that phrase, Tower of Edar? The word Tower of Edar literally means Tower of the Herd or Tower of the Flock. In Micah, the fourth chapter and the eighth verse, it speaks of a tower of the flock, of the Edar. It says, And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. It's predicting there'll be a king related to the tower of the flock. The tower of the flock is near Bethlehem. Can you remember anything that happened 
with sheep at night near Bethlehem? This is the Tower of Adar. So is it possible that they were watching their sheep by night? Where? In the Tower of Adar. Interesting. Is it from heaven? No. There's a painful birth, and then there's a painful betrayal. While Israel lived in the land, doesn't give us a specific time, but Reuben went in and laid with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard of it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. Bizarre, bizarre reference here to something crazy that had happened. Jacob's firstborn is Reuben. He has sexual relations with Bilhah, Rachel's handmaiden. I mean, you can speculate on the psychology issues here. He wanted to be close to his mother. His mother's dead. This could be like an Oprah Winfrey or Jerry Springer show. The crazy thing is Jacob knew about it and did nothing. Reuben knew he'd get away with it because of Jacob's behavior regarding Dinah. Surely this is outrageous behavior that shouldn't stand. Yet it does. And then there's a, pay, a painful burial. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had saw, sojourned. This is a beautiful reunion. He started up here in, in Shechem. He went down to Bethel and then to uh, Epaphra or Jerusalem, and now he's down in Hebron. Isaac was 130 when Jacob left. They are reunited 20, 20 plus years later and have 30 years together. 30 years together. Rebecca, who said when she got Jacob to be part of a ruse, said, may the curse be upon me. Her and Jacob never saw each other again. But he gets 30 years with his dad. Now the days of Isaac were how long? 180 years. And Isaac breathed his last and he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. And his sons, Esau, and Jacob did what? He buried him. He's buried by his sons. The depravity we see here, the deaths of Rachel and Isaac, and the absolutely sick sin of Reuben. But where sin abounded, grace what? Superabounded. Jacob and Esau, these guys who had been split for over 20 years, these guys who had had deception on Jacob's part and hatred on Esau's part, Esau's part are reunited. You can picture them hand in hand saying goodbye to their beloved father at the grave. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The last chapter I want to consider is chapter 36. Everyone say, thank you, Lord, it's almost done. And this is separation. It speaks in chapter 36 almost exclusively about the generations of Esau. Now, is Esau going to be part of the promised seed? Nope. Is Esau going to be like the chosen? Nope. Who's the chosen one? Jacob. Well, why in the world do we have something on Esau? Because people matter to God. Esau matters to God, just as Ishmael mattered to God. We find, first of all, Esau and Canaan, his descendants, his departure, and his dwelling. And he winds up dwelling in Mount Seir. Esau, by the way, is Edom and the father of the Edomites. So as you're reading your Old Testament and you see the word Edom, it's talking about the descendants of Esau. When you read the book of Obadiah, which is specifically against the Edomites, it's talking about the family of Esau. Mount Seir 
is far away from the promised land. It's way over here. This is the Jordan. It's on the other side of the Jordan. Esau is in Mount Seir, Mount, Mount Seir and the text will record his sons and his chiefs, his tribal chiefs. It will record the sons of Seir, the Horite. It will record the kings who reigned in Edom and the names of the tribal chiefs who came from Esau. But the text I want us to read is Genesis 36, 6 through 9. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he acquired in the land of Canaan, and he went into a land away from his brother. For their possessions were too great. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. He goes far away from his brother. Why? Who has the birthright? Jacob or Esau? Jacob. Who has the inheritance? Jacob or Esau? Jacob. Whose land is it now? Who has the promises now? Jacob or Esau? Jacob. Esau doesn't say, I'm going to take you to court. I called 1-800-LAWYERS. Your butt's in a sling, mister. You cheated me out of this. He graciously leaves. He just graciously leaves. We see the depravity here. Esau selling his birthright to Jacob and being cheated out of his inheritance by Jacob and Rachel. But we see the grace. Esau leaving on his own accord, accepting the sovereign plan of God. Where sin abounded, grace did what? Super abounded. So, what's it to me? It's not hard. Where sin abounded, what? Grace super abounded. I got some good news. The good news is, is that God has blessed his children with all kinds of blessings. How many of you are glad that you're forgiven? I got like two hands, throwing up some feet. I'm that Pentecostal today. How many of you are, are, are glad that as you pray, God listens to your prayers? How many, how many are grateful that we have a God who answers prayer? Wow. How, how, how many of us feel really, really, really comfortable with the, with the idea that God intervenes in our life, right? And here's the crazy thing. I have in my DNA this self-destructive issue. And I take the blessings of God and I, I, I mess them up. I mess them up. I'm forgiven and I find ways to sin. I find new ways to sin. I put myself in situations where I mess up. And it's not, it's, 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 it's not the devil made me do it, Dave made me do it. But where sin abounds, what? Grace, grace doesn't just abound. Grace, what? Super abounds. Now, I'm not arguing, I'm not making a case for you to help God by sinning. I'm not saying you really should do something stupid. Why? So that, you know, grace can really abound. That phrase, where sin abounded, grace much more abounded, is found in the book of Romans, the fifth chapter, the 20th to the 21st verses. It says, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And if you could see the word in the original language, it's grace hyperabounded. It just, it went, it, it went off. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And to the person who would say, well, I should sin that grace may abound, the next verses are Romans 6.1 with that same question. 
Should we sin that grace may abound? And the text will tell us, God forbid. But I want us to know, without a shadow of a doubt, that as we walk in this life, as we mess up, as we take the victory that we have been given, and we oftentimes turn it to defeat, we are not done. Because in spite of our stupidity, in spite of our self-destructive behavior, in spite of our sin, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. I am not just forgiven, I am super forgiven. I don't just get a second chance, I get another chance. That's how big my God is. Do any of you kick yourself when you make a mistake? I'm very good at that. I think that it's reasonable to expect a lot of ourselves as followers of Jesus. Would you agree? But the thing that I always have to come back to is I am broken. I, like Jacob, am broken. My kids are broken. Don't tell them that. They're not, they don't know that yet. Don't tell them I'm broken, okay, either. So I must always expect I'm going to struggle, and they're going to struggle. But where sin abounds, together now, grace super abounds. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for your grace that super abounds. Help us, Lord, on this Memorial Day weekend as we continue our struggle, as we, Lord, oftentimes falter and fail, as we tend to be self-destructive and take victory and turn it into defeat. Help us, Lord, to remember every step of the way, you are the God who hears us in our distress and are with us each step of the way. Help us, Lord, to remember that though we falter and fail, your grace is sufficient. And where our sin abounds, your grace is enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jay. Let's all stand and sing Amazing Grace. To amazing grace, how sweet the sound that save a wretch like me. I once was lost but now I found was alive, but now I see. The Lord has promised good. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secure. for it. 
You remain standing. It's Memorial Day weekend, so we want to just take a second to remember those who've given the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms. I'm grateful for all the work Gwendolyn has done to make our, our, our room look festive for this occasion, so we might remember uh, these folks. We just have a, a very brief video that I think will be a blessing. They stood as heroes in our midst, with courage in their hearts and fists. And with each step, they faced the call to serve their land, to give their all. They left behind their homes and kin for fields of battle, fierce and grim. With steadfast hearts and selfless grace to fight for freedom in every place. They marched across the dusty sands to foreign shores and distant lands. And there they fought with all their might in blazing sun and darkest night. Their names now etched in history's page, a lasting tribute for every age to those who served and fell in line to keep our freedoms ever shine. For those who paid the ultimate cost, their lives laid down, their battles lost their sacrifice a priceless gain for the freedom we proudly claim. We honor them with every breath and cherish them beyond their death, their bravery a beacon bright guiding us through the darkest night. So let us pledge with all our might to keep their legacy shining bright and hold them close within our heart their memories never to depart. Amen. Dismiss us, Lord, now with your blessing. Help us to remember the words you have spoken to us. Thank you, Lord, again, this Memorial Day for those who have paid the price for our freedom. We're reminded that freedom isn't free. Thank you for our liberty in Jesus because his death, his resurrection, in his name we pray, amen. You are dismissed. Have an amazing rest of your Memorial Day weekend.